Our reading this morning comes to us from the poet Maggie Smith. Good Bones. Life is short, though I've kept that from my children. Life is short, and I've shortened mine in a thousand delicious, ill-advised ways. A thousand deliciously ill-advised ways that I'll keep from my children. The world is at least 50% terrible, and that's a conservative estimate. Though I keep this from my children, For every bird, there is a stone thrown at a bird. For every loved child, a child broken, bagged, sunk in a lake. Life is short and the world is at least half terrible. For every kind stranger, there is one who would break you. Though I keep this from my children, I am trying to sell them the world. Any decent realtor walking you through a real dump chirps on about good bones. This place could be beautiful, right? You could make this place beautiful. Thank you, Steve. Hell is other people, writes the French existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre. Hell is a human invention, sings the band Every Soul. Give them not hell, but hope, says a misattributed quote to the 19th century universalist preacher, John Murray. Unitarian Universalists believe two very important things. These are our great theological inheritance from the two strands of liberal Christianity from which we come. From the Unitarians, the legacy of the arguments over the Trinity and the arguments over church doctrine. What we take from that history is this, each person has a unique trustworthy relationship with the spirit, with God, with the love that holds us all, with the holy, with the cosmos, with the mystery, and that relationship can sustain when all others fail you or when you fail them. And crucially, that relationship exists outside of the authority of the church or the family or the nation. from the universalists. What happens to one of us happens to us all after death. Therefore, salvation is collective and nobody is free until we all are free. We do not believe in hell after death, certainly, but we are concerned with hell on earth and with the possibility of birthing heaven on earth too. It's possible that the greed of pharmaceutical companies, the politicians whose silence they buy, and the idolatry of intellectual property will mean that wealthy countries will be vaccinated soon and much of the global cell will not be. What would be possible then is the virus could then mutate beyond the capacity of our vaccines to protect us, devastating billions and infecting the world all over again. Hell on earth indeed. Nobody is free until we're all free. We ignore our interdependence at our peril. Arundhati Roy writes historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcass of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world. 
and ready to fight with it. I'm going to show you a video, which is the most hopeful thing I think I've ever seen in my life. Take notes. Looking back, it's hard to believe that we've rebuilt our community from the ground up with our own hands. The first seeds were planted way back in the terror and tenderness of the pandemic. And then change bloomed in the streets, in the fire and struggle of the uprisings. Around here, we'll never forget the day that the last prisoners were released, walking out into the arms of their loved ones. The easy part was finding work. The Community Care Corps was always looking for people in those days, whether for universal family care, burying border walls, or green new public housing, going up one pod at a time. Yep, it was a good time for busy hands. Funny, thinking back to the first wave of the pandemic, that's what you really remember. Hands. Washing, scrubbing, disinfecting, washing again, picturing each other's hands, all the hands that had touched whatever we were touching, the hands that packed the box, that picked the tomato, that planted the seed, the hands that stroked the brow, that said goodbye. The hands were us, all of us, that web of hand to hand, Breath-to-breath -breath relationships was a reminder. We are all entangled, making each other sick, keeping each other alive. That was just one of the lessons of COVID-19. It started in the first great pause, when the smog cleared and the rich fled the cities, when poverty dropped its disguise and racist inequality drew the map of the disease. As the roar of the traffic faded, we arose to birdsong and ambulance sirens. The virus showed us what was truly essential. And we learned again and again that so many of us doing essential work were being treated as sacrificial. From nursing homes to detention facilities, meatpacking plants and fulfillment centers, the virus exposed the cruelty of these warehouses of efficiency and profit. Then, things got worse. In 2023, super droughts led to mega floods. Locusts carved a path across continents and hyper typhoons drove millions from their homes. COVID-23 raced through storm shelters and refugee camps. Supplies ran out again. Meanwhile, dinosaurs roamed the halls of power, bellowing that more sacrifice was needed. But every time they cranked up that rusty old machine called economic growth, the cloud of sickness and death grew. And we couldn't breathe. Couldn't breathe from the asthma in our polluted communities, from the smoke of those fires. We couldn't breathe with a knee on our necks in the clouds of tear gas as we shouted, Black Lives Matter. And that is how the virus changed everything. We finally understood that we couldn't keep patching up the same broken systems. We had to build something new. What was needed was a spark. That spark was us. After months of organizing, the viral rent strike was like a starting gun. Then came the essential worker strike. Delivery drivers, street cleaners, and farm workers got together and said, enough. This time, people didn't just clap 
from their balconies, we flooded into the streets to join together. One of the leaders was Luciela, a young food courier. When a police bullet stole her life, the crowds exploded in size and then exploded again, spreading across borders like a counter virus. The sparks look different in every country as the wildfire strikes leapt across borders. Economies ground to a halt, this time blockaded by workers. We lost too many young heroes as states brought out the iron fist, but it was no match for the rest feast of solidarity. Soon, authoritarian rulers started to topple like statues and new governments were suddenly nervous about ignoring the streets. We joined hands and pushed further, launching the years of repair. The first step was rebuilding the economy around the core of essential work, food and farming, care for young and old, public health, not to mention the essential labor of the more than human world, the winged pollinators, the leafy oxygen makers. The Full Employment Act made the new priorities clear and there was a wave of new worker cooperatives in everything from mental health support to public art and tree planting. Many bosses were made redundant. Our information ecology needed tending too. And so we built a digital commons vaccinated it against surveillance and built up our herd immunity to disinformation. Fossil fuels were running on fumes by that point, so we harnessed their final profits to clean up their messes. Whatever we could, we did outdoors. School, theatre, celebrating. At first, because it was safer. Then, because we realised it made us happier. Nobody talked about missing shopping. Anyway... The right to repair movement meant that a lot of stuff got fixed rather than thrown away and replaced. With life moving at a slower pace, we finally had time to look back. And we began the most important repair of all, repairing relationships. In colonial countries like the US, Canada, Australia and the UK, those were hard conversations. But Truth and Reparations Commissions helped some of us face the truth about the violent conquests of the past and how they shaped our world. That guided where we repaired and how. It turned out that once we fully funded schools and housing and healthcare, we didn't need those bloated budgets for policing, prisons and war. And ultimately, the flow of money on planet Earth had to be reversed. So the North finally started paying its debts, and the South finally stopped. Around here, the Land Back program began the historic process of returning some of the stolen land to indigenous jurisdiction. In the process, we remembered how taking care of the Earth lays the ground for taking care of each other. Within just a few years, we could see the bottom of the river again, and it was safe to drink and fish in its waters. Things aren't perfect, of course. Between mutating viruses and our warming world, there's always new storms headed our way. But when they come, we're ready. With our networks of nurses and neighbors, our small farms and big forests, our systems of care and repair, no one is sacrificed. Everyone is essential. Our Five Smooth Stones series comes to a close with this one. Liberalism holds that the resources divine and human that are available for the achievement of meaningful change justify an attitude of ultimate optimism. 
It helps me to separate hope and optimism, if for no reason other than semantics. The one I have no use for, optimism is a prediction. I am optimistic about the future means I predict good things will happen. When I am optimistic, I'm not an agent. Nothing is required of me, except my attitude. I don't have very much use for optimism. I'm reminded that the Iraq war began 18 years ago this week. I remember being in middle school and thinking it was a catastrophe. And here I am 30 years old and it's still a catastrophe. I don't need to tell you about global poverty and inequity or the deaths and the uneven distribution of sorrow. Uh, due to the virus. I have no use for optimism. However, hope is a discipline, like the prison abolitionist Mariam Akaba writes. Hope is not a feeling or a set of predictions. Hope is a discipline. It lives in our bodies and moves through our communities when we act to bring down the powers and principalities of this world, when we live as if we are truly interdependent. Hope gains a footing in us and grows in the cracks of our broken hearts. Hope is a discipline. We practice when we imagine another way, when we practice living in that other world that is possible. I think often of that line in the gospel according to Matthew about the wise men, the magi who travel across the land to see the birth of Jesus and who are warned in a dream not to return to Herod. So they go home by another road. One of the most beautiful things I have ever seen in a church from, I think, 25 years of going to church almost every week was a few years ago when Mark and the choir practiced improvising. And choir U showed up to the service, having practiced this skill, but unfamiliar with the song that you would sing, you were ready to learn on the spot. And as we had agreed, I handed Mark a piece of paper with these words, wanderer, there is no road. We make the road as we go. Caminante no hay camino, se hace el camino al andar, from the poet Antonio Machado. And Mark composed a few parts and taught them and you sang them right on the spot. Wanderer, there is no road. We make the road as we go. Hope is a discipline. The resources divine and human that are available for the achievement of meaningful change. Show us what is possible. It is up to us to help make it so. Amen. Join us in our closing hymn, Love Will Guide Us. The words are in the video. Yeah.